Um, before we get going, that of course is Miles from the Curiosity. Uh, we haven't got our lung there yet, but I have a goal. So that's might even have to carry it up there myself, but that's my goal. Okay. Um, so originally it was planned that Creston Crab would talk about um, our jung, but but he couldn't make it. So you're gonna have to put up with me talking a bit more. Is there? Ah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no more. No reason for living. Ha, ha, where on on the on the rover? Okay. Wow. I have to find out to go visit them and see what there we can. Other there are other planets. Yeah. <laughs> Further away, bigger, be bigger, better, more exciting. <laughs> oh, no reason for living. Anyway, yeah, another thing. But still. Preston couldn't make it, so I'll talk a bit about a bit slightly more over higher level view of the beam. So unfortunately, things came in slightly wrong order. So we, we start off the deep end in the, in the most difficult bits. Now we're going up to, to the more overview of the system. So yeah, and yeah. So hitch hitchhikers tour of the beam. So of course, wh what is the beam? Um, well, it's a couple of things. It, it's a virtual machine for running for running Allen. Okay. Um, of course, duh. It uh, interfaces to the outside world. So, ha ha I mean, how do you get Alang to talk with the outside world? There are basically two mechanisms. There are ports and there are NIFs. So from the Alang point of view, a port makes the outside world look like a process, while a NIF makes it look, look like a function call. And they're both good, for diff both good to have their uses. It's also a large bunch of built-in or useful functions. Typically, BIFs, right? The things that are in the module Erlang and a few other things written in C as well, too. So either the BIFs in the language or so just some special functions that are handled for efficiency, like list colon reverse. That's actually, that's actually written in C. So if you're going to implement an Erlang system, what are the specific properties of Erlang that, that, make, that are, you need to be aware of? And if, you, if you've... If you've used a language, you've thought of what you've seen all these things, there's nothing strange here as that such. Just want to get them down, right? So it's lightweight massive concurrency, which sets it aside from most other systems. Um, it's well, it's all asynchronous communication based. The whole communication mechanism is asynchronous, all the way down. Uh, we have process isolation, of course. So so things can happily crash without ruining ruining for other stuff as well. Uh, we have error handling, or rather we have primitives for building error handling systems. So it's the same thing with the concurrency model. The, there are primitives in there, and you make more complex things yourself. The same thing with the error handling. There are primitives for making, for building fault-tolerant systems. You yourself have to do it yourself. Do it yourself. The continuous evolution of the system, yes, and it's soft real time, which in this case means yes, there are timing constraints in the problem, but if you overrun them occasionally, it doesn't make that much much difference. It's okay. Um, hard real time people don't call this real-time, real-time. Okay, they, they say, if you run over, that's an error, bang. And there are other properties of the language as well. So, the, so that's properties of the system, right? Then you have language properties you have to be aware of as well. For example, things like immutable data, it's heavily used for pattern matching and it's a functional language and other things as well too. Um, these aren't specific to our language anyway. If you look at most functional languages, you'll have you'll find they have the same concepts, the same features. They might look slightly different and it works slightly different way, but that, all the basic stuff's there, right? So it's the system side that's, that's in that, this sense, more important. Um, although you can't ignore these things. So if pattern matching wasn't done efficiently, it would slow down the system notably. So, if, for example, you need efficient pattern matching, for example. That's not, not rocket science. There are lots of different ways of doing that. You can read papers on them, books about how to describe how to do that. So if Erlang is to run on the beam, the beam needs to be able to do all of this, at least all these things. Right? Okay. So we're not going to look at everything. I'm not going to look at the, the language features. As I said, you can, I can give you a number of books to read if you're interested in, in how to do it. We want to look at some things um, which have already been mentioned. So, um, both Lucas and Eric Stenman took up, uh, mentioned a number of these features. Now I'm just going to look a slightly more overview of the whole thing here. So, yes. 
So we're going to look at schedulers, the processes, a bit about memory management, message, message passing, multi-core, and a few other things as well too. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to give a very sort of um, logical, straight-through presentation of these because they all interact with each other. So we'll be jumping around a little bit on this one. And th the basis for the whole SMP side, or, or multi-core, however you want to call it, is that um, the SMP handling should be transparent to the programmer. You shouldn't have to be able to go in you shouldn't have to, be, have to be forced to go in and work out if, uh, how many cores am I running on now, do, do I have to restructure my system to, to use that number of cores I'm running, etc., etc. You shouldn't have to be able to do that. The system should be able to do it for you, though sometimes you actually may, you may want to. Okay. There, are, there are times you don't want to let it go by default. It might, do, it might, re, reuse your res, it might use your resources in the wrong way, for example, and other things like this. So sometimes you do. And the basis for the whole thing is that the scheme use, that the beam uses something called schedulers. So when you start up a beam, an Allang virtual machine, one operating system process, to however you want to look at it, it will start up a number of schedulers when you run. This is just pure by, def by default. There's nothing. This, this is how it works. So what's a scheduler? So a scheduler in this case, I, I, I call it a semi-autonomous beam virtual machine. So it's got most of the things you need in it to be able to run Erlang, with the stuff, with ports, with handling NIFs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in there. It's got most of the, each one's, can, each one's more or less autonomous, or well, could be autonomous. But of course, they're running in the same system, so they have to be able to communicate with each other. Otherwise, you get lots of little Erlangs instead. By default, well, one, you run one scheduler per VM thread. Okay, that just, that's how it works. That's how you get... Um, the independence of them, that's how you, they can run concurrently or in parallel. And by default, when you start the system up, you get one thread, one scheduler per processor core. That's just the default. Um, okay, they are, they are quite autonomous. They try to be. So, so, for example, each one has its own run queue, or actually a number of run queues for different things, which it tries to manage as independently as possible. Um, and they try to run as separately as possible, of course, so you can avoid the nasty things like locks and synchronization. And locks and synchronization, no matter how smart you are, they always cost you. So the less locks and synchronization you can have, the better the system's going to run. This is a fact of life. So, for example, uh, well, as Lucas was talking about, each, each uh, scheduler does, tries to do as much of its own memory management as possible, for example. You don't want to go out and, and, and try and synchronize. Yes, you can call the operating system, do a malloc or something like this, and yes, that will be thread safe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's an awful lot of work going on on the operating system to make sure it is thread safe. And if I can avoid that, fine. So yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, one of the thing, interesting things that the schedulers do is load balancing. So if I run, if I run up something on a number of, core, number of cores, number of schedulers, the system will try and balance the, uh, balance the load on these cores as much as possible by itself. This is just sort of built into the system. Um, Eric Stenman was mentioning these, getting into it. He'll look more at the details, but this is the basic principle, right? You don't want to, you, you don't want, if you've got eight cores, I don't want one core running at 150% type of thing and all the rest doing nothing, right? Because that's just a very bad usage of resource. I want to try and spread the load as much as possible. So yeah, so I want to spread things out. But at the same time, I want to compact things because it's actually beneficial to, to, to reduce the number of cores. Um, it's, for example, memory, memory locality. It's better for memory locality if I'm running fewer cores to do things for it. And, well, especially hyper-threading here as well too. So, so we've got two, two opposite things here in the system. I, I want to load, spread things out as much as possible get an even load on the system, make sure nothing overloads. I want to compact things as much as possible to make sure to get better performance out of it. So we've got these, these, these two um, goals conflicting with each other. So how does it do it? Well, there are a number of ways it does the load balancing, spreading things out. And the first way, the simplest way, is something called process stealing. It actually steals more things than processes, but this is the basis of it. So this is the primary mechanism that's used 
um, to, load, to load balance and spread processes. And it's, it's purely local. So how it works is that if a scheduler finds it has nothing to do, so it's, there, it has no runnable processes, there's nothing in the process queue, and none of the process it knows about, it owns, uh, have anything to do, it will try and go out and find steel processes from another scheduler. So basically, you look at the scheduler beside it and, and say, does this scheduler have anything in its run queue? And if it does, it will steal it. It will try to steal it anyway. Because the other scheduler will be doing something else anyway. So it will, tr it will try and steal th 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 that, um, that process. If the nex next one doesn't, of course, then it will try looking at the next one along the line to see if it can try and find a process it can steal over to get work for it. So in this case, if we look at these, th this simple case here with the four schedulers, scheduler three has nothing to do. There's nothing in its run queue, it's not doing anything, it's just sitting there. So it will try and go out and to scheduler four and see if it can t pick one of the processes in its run queue and take it over and hand it over. Um, it only steals from run queue, it never steals running or suspended processes. This is just work. Uh, this is not free. I mean, it takes a bit of work to move a process from one, one schedule to another. So it's not free, but it's, it's a very simple mechanism to try and load balance things. And it, it's done at a purely local level for it. So all the, all, all the schedulers are doing this. If they've got nothing to do, they'll go out and try and find another process to run. So th that's at a more local level. That's the main, that's the main thing for spreading, the main mechanism for spreading the load. But there is another, there is another level as well too, of load balancing. And that is, uh, Eric went into a bit, bit about this, that's the fact that once every a period, I have got a 40k reductions, he was saying uh, 4 million reductions, I don't know exactly where the figure is, someone might know better, but the principle is that all the schedules are running, and once someone has reached this many reductions, it says, oh, I'm the manager, I'm now, I'm now the scheduler manager, right? or master scheduler. And um, it's basically the first one to reach that count. Now, at this stage, nothing stops. The machine is still running. We're not, we're not pausing the machine in any way here. The machine is still running. And what this master will try and do, will try and look at all the schedulers and find out how much work are they doing, how much work have they been doing. Look in their run queues, what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera, like this. And it will try and optimize. It will try and balance and optimize. And it's at this level it can detect that, yeah, uh, we might have eight cores, but we're actually only running at about 200% load. So having all these eight cores is actually a big waste, and we could probably close down three or four of them quite nicely and spread the existing load out on the, in the system. And it try and tries to work things out, out like this as well. And if it detects other schedules, well, it doesn't move things, because then you have to do synchronizing, but it can tell other, other schedulers to move processes across, and they will do it and try and do this balancing for it. And when it detects those schedulers no longer being used, it can shut down that core, or put on suspend or whatever you want to call it. Which is, of course, very nice, because that saves energy. And it doesn't make anything slower, because we're still not um, overflowing our, our schedulers, our threads. And again, then when it's done, it stops and, it, it, well, it keeps on going and then all the schedules run until the next time someone reaches this level and becomes a new master and does basically the same thing. So this is, a more this is trying to optimise the usage at a more global level. So doing things like being able to, compacting and being able to suspend schedules, you can't do that locally. I, 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 can, my, I can't look at myself and say, I've got nothing to do, so I'll put myself to sleep because maybe all the other schedules have got long run queues. So th this can be only done at a global level. And as the other guys mentioned, there's a large number of plus S flags which allow you to control these things. How much you, how much you want to drive it to try and compact things as much as possible or not. Perhaps I do want to spread it. Perhaps I've sold the system as being able to, which balances, keeps the ba ex explicitly as balanced as possible over everything, and then I don't want to compact it because that's not what I've said it should do. Right? So I've got a lot of flags for doing things like this. Um, yeah, that's that. Yeah, by the way, reductions. Um, we spread that around. We use that quite happily, it's especially function calls. 
this is from the bad old days when Erlang was written as a prologue uh, with a prologue interpreter, and prologue doesn't do function calls, it does reductions. So we use the word reductions for counting how much work Erlang did. And that stayed, even when we became functional and when we left prologue, it's still called reductions. So as, as the other guys mentioned, these are not just pure function calls. You can think, have things doing work and say, yeah, we've now done the equivalent of five function calls or wherever it might be before it's a reduction. So yes. Okay. Um, a little bit about scheduling processes. So by default, well, what happens is when you spawn a process or a process spawns another process, the new process will end up on the same scheduler as the original process. Nothing strange there. And a process can be in multiple states. So it can be running. It's what's actually being running. It can be runnable. It's in the run queue. Um, it can be waiting. It can be suspended, sitting there waiting, and in a receive, waiting for a message which hasn't arrived yet. It can be exiting. So when a process decides it's going to die or it's been killed, it actually goes into a state where it's going to clean up after itself, for example, free memory. It's going to send. Um, signals down all its links and things like this for it. So it's, it'll be in an exiting state. And it can also be garbage collecting. So here, when we garbage collect, to pro when we garbage collect to the island this in the beam, we garbage collect one process at a time. So each process garbage collects separately. To say a bit more about that, this has the benefit that garbage collection times are generally very short and s very d it's very rare you get past the case where they're not short enough for our real-time requirements for it. But it can be garbage collecting. Or and it can be suspended. You can't actually suspend the process. It's still there, it's still alive, but it will never run until you, until you resume it afterwards. I don't really know why you want it, but it's there anyway. So it can be in a suspended state as well. Yeah. So yeah, so, so processes suspend when waiting for messages. And I think the important thing here is to realize this is not a busy wait. The process isn't out polling. Do I have any messages? Do I have any messages? Do I have any messages? It's just sitting there. It's suspended, and when a message is sent to the process, then the process is put on the run queue. So that means it doesn't cost anything to have a lot of processes that are sitting there waiting suspended. It doesn't cost any execution time. Memory, yes, but that's it. Right? Therefore, it's quite possible. I mean, if you, if you can have a process a system with, say, 100,000 processes, only, only a few thousand might be you doing something at one time. The others just sitting there will be just be sitting there suspended waiting for messages and not cost anything. And when a message arrives, the bec process becomes runnable. And the uh, important thing here is that when a running pr process, that will be suspended for two reasons, well, multiple reasons. Two re the two main reasons are when it, when it goes in to receive and waits for a message. So it goes in, it doesn't find any message which matches, then it's suspended. Also, um, there's, there's a preemptive schedule in the system which reschedules processes after 2,000 reductions. So irrespective of doing a lot of work, after 2,000 reductions, this process will be rescheduled and put on the end of the run queue. And this means that no process can block the system or even block a, a scheduler. It will always, be always be scheduled out. And this, this gets back to original requirements we had, for example, of, of latency. The system should never block. It should always be allowed to do new things in. And when I'm writing my program, I shouldn't have to worry about writing things out and, and, and um, having to think about these things. So the system, the system does it. Um, I can say this is, th I mean, this is nothing strange. Most operating systems do that. I mean, any, most real operating systems, even Windows, I mean, does these type of things for <laughs> you can't block on it. So that's nothing strange. Um, yeah, Th that just gets back to one slight push here, but uh, get back to um, one thing we found quite early on. When you're starting to think about Alink systems, you find they're very operating system like. It's not like so much programming, a programming language as such. Running, running something. You're, you're building a whole system. It's very operating system-like with the processes, communication, etc., etc. And a lot of the features uh, in the language support that view, and also a large number of the libraries support that as well too. I, I won't go into it here, but I could take up the rest of the talk about that, but I won't. Yeah. yeah anyway, so yeah, we're scheduling processes, which means nothing blocks. Uh, this is less important today when you've got multi-cores, but back in the old days when you had only had one thread. 
that was very critical. We have ports as well too, of course. That, that's one of the ways you're creating. They're also managed by the schedulers. Um, so again, when you create a port, it's created on the same scheduler. Some port activities are scheduled. Uh, it's not preemptive in that sense. When a port is running, the code for the port, the actual port implementation, is written in C. And there, then when the system calls that, it gives up control to that, so you, we won't automatically uh, preempt that or anything like this for it. And so when you're writing LinkedIn drivers, which are a way of writing code in C, which from the Allang point of view looks like a port, and you send messages backwards and forwards from them, you have to be careful. If you're not careful, you can block the system or block your core doing that. It's exactly the same problem as with NIFS. So you have to be careful to do that. So that's ports. But they're also scheduled to manage. I think actually, I think, I haven't quite grasped this yet, but I think you um, schedulers can steal ports as well too from others. Someone who knows will have to wave their hand and say, yes, we'll know about that. They can? Yep. So we, you can do a lot of stealing going on, right? So we kill things and we steal from things as well too. So yes. Well, we're pretty criminal people, actually. <laughs> the system's pretty criminal, you think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> don't, don't quote me here, because these, <laughs> these type of quotes tend, tend to, to, to annoy people. Yes. I'm not going to talk about the Let It Die, t Kill Our Children t-shirts. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> okay, so memory management. Yeah. So uh, Lucas went into a lot of det details of some of these features. I'll just give a more slightly overview about it. And the basic idea is... There are lots of different mi type memory areas for handing different types of memories, different type of memory in the system for different requirements. Um, they had different properties and different needs. Okay, so this is nothing strange. The system gets complex. And either you can have a naive memory management system which is slow, or you can have a more complex one which is fast. You just have to take your pick. Right? As I said, you can replace all these and just call uh, malloc, for malloc and free for everything, and it'll work, but it won't be very fast. It'll actually be quite slow. So we have things like process heaps. Each process has its own heap. Its tables, they're in a separate memory ar area as well, too. Um, the atom table is completely separate, it's a separate block of data. We have something I call a large binary space. That's where, you put, that's where big binaries, big being bigger than 64 bytes, are put. Code somewhere. There are timers. Not going to go through all these things, but there are lots of different memory areas in the system. They're separate because they're di they have different requirements and different needs. So the easiest one is the atom. I think the atom table. So um, all atoms, in the system, are in turn in, in a global table. There's one big global atom table, uh, which is very nice. So if I've got an atom foo in one part of the program, it's it's, it's the same atom foo in another part of the program which means all atom comparison is very fast. I'm literally just comparing an index into the table. So you never need to use integers as tags. So you can actually quite happily use integers as tags and get very make both make the code readable and make it fast. The trouble is, atoms are never deleted from the table. So once you put an atom in the table, it's there until the system goes down. Um, that's a problem of how memory is managed in the system seeing there's no, really no central garbage, global garbage collector for everything, there is no, if, if we, it would be very difficult to keep track of when you'd actually free an atom. It could be done, but it would be very difficult. That means you should be careful creating new atoms on the fly. Okay? Because if you do it wrongly, you will overflow the atom table, and that, that is your classic, that's one of the classic ways of crashing the system. So you should avoid programs that rampantly create atoms in an uncontrolled fashion. You will, uh, I think the, the default atoms table size is somewhere around a million atoms. I think that's, that's, that's some, the default somewhere up around there anyway. And you will never write, create that many atoms in your code. You, a million's a lot. Right? It's a lot of words. Um, and if you create atoms dynamically, for example, using, for say, trying to be unique, some things or tags or whatever, then you can quite easily, quite quickly overflow that and you'll crash the system. There are cases, I mean, I might dynamically create atoms foo one to foo thousand again and again and again. That's really no problem because I've still only got a thousand. That's, that's quite right. But it, 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 keep it uncontrolled. 
And the atom, ta atom so table size is fixed. You can't increase it while the system's running. So when you fill up, you crash. So that's atoms. So they're great things, but you have to be slightly careful about how and when you create them. And I can also add that creating atoms because you want something unique isn't. So uh, I cannot create a guaranteed unique atom. I can give it a long, weird, funny name, but if, I, if someone else, somewhere else in the program creates exactly the atom with exactly the same long, weird, funny name, they're the same. I, I, can, I cannot guarantee the uniqueness of atoms. So we've got the large binary space. And the idea is th there that large binaries, which in this case means greater than 64 bytes, are not stored in process heaps, they're stored in a separate area. Um, that has a, has a lot of benefits. So if I'm sending binaries but from, from uh, one process to another, and it's large, in a sense, I, d I don't copy it. The binary is being created somewhere in a separate memory area, and I'm basically just sending a reference to, to that binary around, so I can send it around. Which means I can do things like actually streaming, streaming large amounts of data through the system, so I'm not copying it. That's why you can have systems that actually do, stri that, that do streaming video to, to it because you're not just not copying data for it. And it can save a lot of memory as well. Um, in this case, binaries are... Sh I just want to point out, I think a question arose somewhere recently. Where did I, I can't remember where I saw it now. But, um, so if I create a, uh, a binary in a process and then I, then I store that into, into a NETS table, I'm not copying the binary. The binary is still in the large binary space. I'm just putting another reference to it from the ETS table. So if I've got large binaries and I'm moving them backwards and forwards between processes or between processes, nets and tables, I'm not copying them. So I'm sharing it that way. Um, the problem with binaries, or the binary space, is that it can take a long time to reclaim a binary. So, so what can happen is I've got a large binary, from I, make, I make it in one process, I put it together, then I send it through a chain of processes until it gets to the other end and then, then it's used and disappears. The trouble is, I can't, to be able to reclaim that binary, each process, it will be ref tagged up in each process that it arrives in. Each process will then contain, say, yeah, I've got a reference to this binary. In it. And that binary can't be removed until all the processes along the path have been garbage collected and each one says, no, I no longer have a reference to this binary. So it's, it's literally a reference counting scheme. So every process it comes to bumps the reference by one and it's only on garbage collection of the processes that the reference de is decremented. That can be a serious problem. Um, you can overflow the system because it takes so long time for, your, for some of your binaries to get re reclaimed. You might have processes along the path which do very little work and create very little data which will garbage collect very seldom. And they can, they can keep their reference to these binaries and take a long time to... Um, for the binary to, binary to be reclaimed. Um, that has crashed systems before, and will probably keep doing it. It's just something to be aware of. Um, with a lot of these things, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's some form of heuristic you want to optimize for. And for some times, it'll be, be a big win, and for some people, it will be very bad. Unfortunately, that's not much you can do about it. The way around, of course, is if you, if you get this problem, you can actually s explicitly start garbage collecting processes. Uh, if to get rid of the references, then, then they'll disappear much faster. That again costs. Garbage collection isn't free. So again, you have to you have to wear. So yeah, um, it's tables. Again, they're separate. They're separate from process heaps. So one of the there are two basic reasons for for initially for implementing it's tables, and one was to be able to do a fast preferably constant time lookup into ETS tables, which is what we have. And the second one was to be able to store large amounts of data outside the process heaps. Because, I mean, if you put a gigabyte of data or gigabytes of data in your process heap, that pro garbage collecting that process is going to take a noticeable amount of time which you, which you want to avoid. So you put it outside. The thing to remember here is that the memory in a process heap or in a process is never shared with the data in the ETS table. 
So a process always works on its own data, its own data. And um, when you access an ETS table, you're copying that element from, from the ETS table into your own process heap. Then you're working with it. When you're writing things, when you're putting something into an ETS table, you build a tuple on your heap, then you copy it over and put it in the ETS data area. Okay? So you're copying backwards and data backwards and forwards. Um, this actually means that you're not, the ETS data is not shared. I, 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 so Alan actually doesn't have shared data. I'm not sharing data. I'm not, I'm not, lots of processes aren't writing their things if, or reading from, from the ETS table. They're making their own copies and working with them. So actually ETS, uh, ta ETS tables are very process-like. It's just that there is no explicit m uh, message passing um, access to them, but they actually behave in a very process-like way. Of course, copying is not good. Well, you w something you want to try and avoid. That's why you have things like match and select, because they allow you to do a lot of work s picking out exactly which elements I want before I actually copy them into my process. Otherwise, I could just do I could just do um, first and then do next, 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 and step over each one, copying it and looking for it. The match and select allow me to do a lot of that work before I actually while the data is still in the, pro in the ETS table. That's, that's one reason for them. But the big thing here is I can, I can store large amounts of data in ETS tables. Gigabytes is um, not uncommon. And if you go talk to Klarna, they, they have terabytes of data when their ETS tables run. So you can have lots of data in there. Uh, not implicitly garbage collected. What that means is, Yes, of course, they're garbage collected. So if I delete, if I delete an element from a table, of course, that memory is reclaimed. Or if I delete a table, of course, it's reclaimed. What this means is that the, that the NETS table won't go away by itself just because no one references it anymore. It's like a process. A process won't die just because no one's referenced it anymore. It's, it's, it sits there until you kill it. Right? And it's t same thing with NETS table. Even if no one references the data is still there. But of course, the memory is reclaimed. Otherwise, it'd be useless. Um, yeah, and of course, ETS tables are linked to the process that created them. That's why I'm saying they're process-like. If that process dies, then the ETS table goes away, which is great fun if you're sitting experimenting in the shell. I've put up an ETS table. I've filled it with stuff. I'm doing work. I do an error in the shell, and the table's gone. Yeah. <laughs> Done that, been there. So yes, but they're very, for what they were designed for, they're a very nice thing to do. They're a very nice thing to do for it. And I'm not going to get into the discussion of when, you, when to use ETS tables and when not to use ETS tables. That's a long discussion. And it's, there's, no, there's no one reply for it, one answer for it. Yeah. OK, process heaps. So as I mentioned before, each process has a separate heap. And all process data is local to the process itself. This is not just things that are on the heap, but as Eric was mentioning, there's other things which are local to a process. And each process has its own copy of stuff. So all the data the process is working on is local to the process. Um, and there are, yeah, so, so what happens is when you create a process, it by default it starts off with a very small heap. So that's why you see things that the minimum process size is two or three hundred words, which it is, it just starts off with a tiny heap in a stack. And it will grow. So the more data you put in, it will grow, and it will grow by do when it runs out of memory by doing garbage collection and saying, yeah, I need more memory, then it will increase the process heap and, and again and again and again. Um, I can set the minimum process heap size. So I can say, I can, I can start off this process with one megabyte of memory, because I know it's going to grow big, which is interesting. It also means that the sending of messages is, is done by copying data. So when I send a message, I copy from one process to another. It just fits. This is actually not required um, by Alang, this, by the Alang, the language, the semantics. This, you might say, is an implementation detail. Uh, all the language specifies is that, that, that the data in one process should be isolated from the data in another process, and if one process crashes, that, that, that's not going to affect the data of another process. But seeing you have immutable data in the system, you can actually share data between processes. That, yeah. So we don't need separate process heaps for the isolation. Then you ask, of course, isn't all this data copying terribly inefficient, right? 
I'm sending messages, happily sending messages backwards and forwards, I'm copying data backwards and forwards, and wouldn't it be better um, to just share data and send a reference? Well, yeah, sort of, maybe. Right? <laughs> but, and there's a very big but here, probably made even bigger. As with, as with all these things, it's trade-offs. It's all trade-offs. And there are a lot of benefits of having separate process heaps. Yes, I pay because I'm copying data between them. I pay by using more memory. But, as I mentioned before, having separate process heaps means I can garbage collect each process separately. Right. If I'm sharing data, garbage collecting processes suddenly becomes much more complex. Um, and the pro generally, the garbage collection times are so small, you don't notice them, or they're short enough. The garbage collector becomes much more efficient. I don't have to do a real-time collector. I can just do a stop and collect for it because the short times are so short. And that, trust me, is a big win. Um, the garbage collector will become, will become more efficient. It also becomes simpler. And that might sort of sound like a trivial thing, but I can assure you, implementing garbage collectors is a right pain. Right? Because every time you get an error in there, you're not going to detect the error then. You're going to detect it a couple of garbage collections later, or when your reference memory, when some point is pointing in the completely wrong area. Then trying to find, go back and try and find out actually what went wrong is difficult. Not trivial. So, we'll say, so keeping the garbage collection simpler is a big win. It also means it's easier to do more, um, have I use better garbage collection algorithms. Now I'm just talking about the process heap, not about the whole memory management thing, but even inside the process heaps, it's, uh, it, you, can use, you can use more complex and better mechanisms for it. And it keeps the synchronization down. So if I have processes sharing, especially if they're, on, uh, if they're on separate threads, and I have the processes sharing memory, I need to synchronize when I'm doing garbage collection on that. Because one, one, one thread might be, changing, might be changing the memory under the foot feet of another thread, and I have to start synchronizing for it. A and this, this, trust me, is a big win. I've got an example at the end. I'll just give some examples of that. And th the more cores you have, the bigger the win it is. Just about that. So, yeah, the garbage collector, it's a copying collector. Nothing strange here. This is standard for this type of language. Copying garbage collector means you just, you're copying the data which is actually live and you're leaving behind everything which is, uh, which is no, no, longer, no longer in use. Um, that's the best, generally the best al type of algorithm for this type of system where you're creating lots of temporary data. So there's nothing strange here. It's a generational collector. So here we have multiple generations in the garbage collector. And again, this is based on the heuristic that most data you create dies young. Okay. Some will survive and data which survives in a long time actually usually becomes very old, right? So if I can create just garbage collector new data, the newly created data, the chances are I'll find most of the garbage there. So we do that. We have separate generations. We have an old and new generation. And I just garbage collect the new... It, it, when we're out of memory, I just garbage collect the new data. Now, some of that's going to be saved. I can garbage collect that a couple of times. And eventually, I have to put it back into the old data been around long enough, so now we're saying this is old. Um, and generally speaking, not much data ends up in the old heap. That's the whole goal of it, right? I can do most of the stuff in the new heap, only a little bit ends up in the, in the old heap. So most of the garbage collections I do are only of the new heap, which is good. But eventually the old heap will fill up and then I have to garbage collect the whole process. That's, by the way, is when I can detect I no longer have references to um, large binaries. I want to do full collections. Because I can't be certain until I've collected everything, right? That's the trouble with it. And um, just guessing and hoping is not good enough. So I can tune these things. Here, here are just a couple of simple ways of tuning things, right? There are lots um, of doing these things. So I, I can, uh, as I mentioned before, I can set the process, the minimum process heap size. So I can start off a process not being as small as possible, being bigger, because I know it's going to grow. And that will save me um, a bit of CPU time while the process is growing because I'll be doing less garbage collection, just filling things up. The downside is, of course, the, proce the process will never get smaller than this. So it, it takes more memory. 
Uh, I can set this both at a per process level and a system level. So I can say, yeah, every process in the system have a minimum size of one megabyte. That's quite a lot more than the default three or 400. I can also say, okay, how often do I want to do full sweeps? How often when I'm garbage collecting my process do I want to garbage collect the whole process heap and not just the, um, the new generation? So I can set that. And the more often I do a full sweep, the more me total, the more memory I'm going to reclaim. So I'll use less memory in my heap. But it's going to cost me more C CPU time to do it. So I can say, yeah, every time you do a garbage collection, do a full sweep. So it's, yes, it uses less memory, reclaims large binaries faster, but it's less efficient because you're doing more workload. And again, it's a trade-off, what, what I want to do. I can set these at per process or system levels as well. There are a lot of other options. You saw some more of them, this those were here this morning, saw a lot of these, a lot of these things to control this. Just a simple level here. Yeah. And we've got the async thread pool, which also mentioned. Um, trouble is, well, a trouble is that if you're doing file I.O. or other I.O., that is generally very slow compared to what the rest of the machine can do. I mean, r reading stuff from a file compared to, to running instructions is very slow. So if I have one, one thread, say, running on one core, and it goes out and does a file I.O. and sits and waits for a millisecond, that's an awful lot of work I'm not doing while that's hanging around. Um, I don't want to be forced to write um, non-blocking I.O. by hand, because that's a right pain. If, if you don't believe me, just try a bit of Node. I want to be able to go read on the file and sit and wait for the reply and come back and keep on going. It's, it's a very nice way of writing things. But I don't want to wait this block the system. So there is something called the async thread pool. That's a set of extra threads which are used for doing these type of file IOs. So when I do a file IO, a, uh, one of the async threads is chosen out and that, that read operation sent is passed over to it and it's done there. And if it has to sit and wait, that it's that thread that sits and waits. My thread will keep on going. Yes, my process will be rescheduled, but the, but the thread itself will keep on going and doing other stuff as well too. And then when the IO operation has been done, it'll be, my thread will be notified and the process will be rescheduled and I'll keep on going work, working through it. So it's a very nice one. Um, and the file I, I built-in mechanisms used and if they're created. I think by default it's 10, I think you get now, don't you? Yeah, I think two versions ago it was zero, but now it's 10. And you can set that. There's a, there's a plus capital A for setting how many asynchronous threads you want to run in the system. Um, again, how much, how much I.O. are you going to do, if it's worth it or not? I think Basho, someone have correct me, Basho has an awful lot of them because they're doing a lot of I.O., right? So for them it's worth it. Um, Linked import drivers can use them if they exist, if you write your driver in that way. The INET driver never does. It's apparently not, not worth the effort for them to do that. And yeah, this is just nearing the end now here. Um, yeah, avoid long-running NIFs. We've all heard this, right? And, and it's true. It's, it's, it's true here to do that. Um, there are lots of different reasons for it. Memory is not freed while they're running. Um, while a NIF is running, the scheduler has given up control to, the, to your C code. So it has no idea what's going on, has no idea of time and anything like this for it as well too. And it delays a lot of functionality that the thread needs to do. So if you're loading code, the thread can't take part in that while it's running your NIF because it, ne it needs to be in control. This is no problem when you're running Allen code because every function call you can go out and check these things if it's necessary to do anything. But here, I don't. I hand over control, I can do that. Also, it skews the scheduler's view of how much work it's doing. So yes, your scheduler could be running a full blast, but the Allang system can think it's doing nothing because it hasn't bumped any reduction counts and I can't talk to it in any way like that. So that has also happened, that um, they can be put to sleep and they ne perhaps not wake up when necessary. So th this is a serious problem, to be, to be honest here. It, it, it's not difficult to work around. So, all native code only does bits of small work. So, so if you're calling an if, it should come back pretty quickly to the Erlang system, then you're running back in Erlang and you're, you're counting stuff and doing whatever you need to do in there. And I think the limit's somewhere around one to four milliseconds for it. Um, if, the sh if a NIF is doing more work, 
or even if it's doing this little work, it, it can tell the system I've been doing some work by calling the uh, consume time slice uh, function, which just tells the system, yeah, I've, I've, done I've done some work now, and it can use that when it's balancing the system. Um, there are dirty schedulers, which if I got the whole thing correctly, is you move over these dirty things onto separate schedulers and not block the other ones. And it says quite, a bit, perhaps a bit euphemistically, that if you have control of your native code, you shouldn't have to use this. I just rewrite my NIF so they don't block. I can, I can have my NIF start ha run things in separate threads as well. So I can do quite a lot of complex stuff in there. I can do things in separate threads which won't block the system. Sometimes, though, I'm running other bits of code which I don't have control over, therefore I might have to use them. But if you can avoid them, don't. And we'll just end up with, well, one thing here. How to crash the beam. Right, so everyone knows this. Well, I mentioned this. Fill the atom table. That's a good one. I, ju I, just create atom I just create atoms and the system goes down and I get a very big crash dump telling me all the atoms in the atom table. Right? Um, overflow the binary space. Yeah. Uncontrolled process heap growth. This is a good one. Um, I just create more data. Infinite recursion. I put more messages... I put messages faster in the message queue than the process can handle. Or I put messages in the message queue the process won't handle. And eventually that just builds up more and more memory and the eventually the system will just run out of memory. Or I can have a lot of data. That's more difficult. But the message queue is quite nice. You typically see this, for example, in error loggers. You're logging just too much information and the lo logger can't process it fast enough and, and the message queue builds up over time and the system goes down. Um, errors in NIFs and linked in port drivers. So NIFs and LinkedIn port drivers are written in C, and there you're out of control of the system. So if you've got a bug in your code here, you'll crash the Allen system. So if you do divide by zero in a NIF, the whole system goes down. There's no way to stop it. That's another reason why to avoid NIFs as well, too, by the way. So yeah. Oh, I just want to do one... Th here's the thank you. I just want to show one thing here. Um, a lock example. Just one simple example of why locks and synchronizations an example of how, how costly loss, locks and synchronization can be. It doesn't sound it. It sounds, well, what's the problem, right? So here we have an example of a program, an Allang program that actually starts thousands of Allang processes. So we're actually doing, s and they're all running separately. So it's actually, this is actually very, it's very concurrent. It's very, very parallel application. And if you look here, you'll find that the more schedulers I put on it, the slower it goes, which is not quite what I would expect, right? So I'm, I'm running a parallel application here. I'm not quite expecting. So if I flip the uh, data the other way, I can see the speed up. It gets slower while this is going on. Okay, what's going on here? W th that shouldn't be. Right? This, is, this is not what I'm paying for, so to speak. And did I get too many now? Yeah, there we are. Yeah. So how does this work? Now this spawns a lot of processes I think it defaults two or three thousand processes here, so there's no chance of not of, of um, having schedulers with nothing to do, and it creates timestamps. They all create a long list of timestamps. They actually sort them along the way, and then send the result into a parent process that's sitting there waiting. And it uses Allen colon now to create timestamps. Now Allen colon now is nice. If you haven't used it, it, it returns the time from what, the 1st of January 1970 in microseconds as a tuple of three elements. Um, so it's great, but it has one property. It guaranteed that every call you make will be, will be it's monotonically increasing every call you make over, over the whole Allen node. Okay, so I if I've got different processes calling it, each one will become bigger. And well, that causes a lot of problems, but the one I'm here after here is. This has to synchronize. So when I call Alan colon now, I have to go, I have to lock, go in, get the value, bump the value, then remove the lock, and I get my value. And if someone, every time someone comes in, they have to start locking these things. Um, so it was a nice idea. It worked fine on a, sing on a single processor, but a typical type of thing, it doesn't scale. And this is an example of why locks and synchronization are actually very costly, and why a lot of efforts put in the beam to avoid these things because they are very costly. And this, the, the more parallelism you have in your system, the more costly this becomes. Right? Um, the alternative is to use OS colon timestamp, 
which more or less returns exactly the same thing, but there, is no, there are no guarantees, it doesn't have any guarantee and doesn't need locking points, which solves the same thing. So this is one of the things we just got wrong. It's a nice feature because I can see, I can give you absolute time warning order <coughs> things, but it's very costly. So yeah, that's just an example for it. Okay, I will, I will admit, happily admit that this is very, uh, this is a pathological case, right? That's all we're doing, but it's just an example of the problem. So yeah, that's it. Questions? I manage. <laughs> I managed to not run over time too much, so I'm very pleased with myself. Yep, uh, that's an accomplishment. A a any questions? Oh, clear as mud. Okay, yeah, yeah, John. Which is the oldest still running Erlang process? The oldest still running Erlang process. I have absolutely no idea. Do you, do you know? <laughs> no, I have no idea. <laughs> Who's had a system running for a long time? I quite happily crash things. I, I don't worry about that. But uh, yeah. No. Nope. Okay. No. Nope. Okay. There was. Ah, one more. Okay. Um. Uh. Oh yeah. Do shared binary reads use locks or synchronization or not? Um. They must use some, I think. Otherwise, you can't get around it. You can't, you're working on it. So having some binary that's used by all the processes is... Yeah, but you only have to, you only have to do things with it when you... We only have to lock things when you're actually doing something with it. Yeah. So, so I, can, I, uh, okay. I mean, yeah, the, yeah. the data's just there, right? You, you need locking when you, when, when, you have, when, when you can have multiple threads doing something with the data. Reading's not... Reading's safe, right? Okay. But when actually working on it. And th there's a lot of uh, optimization gone on to doing s oh, doing smart usage of binaries. Right? So if you do something like a, um, uh, a binary comprehension, where you're building a binary and appending new values to it the whole time, you're actually not creating a new b binary every time. If you write it by hand, you might be, but the binary comprehension doesn't. It creates a binary that's a bit it's too big. And you just keep filling in more data to it. But I don't see the whole. I don't see the whole block of data. I see. I see a little binary thing, which is a reference to the data, saying how, where it starts and how big it is. So I can have one. I can have a big binary here, wh where I see spe separate chunks of it, so separate sized chunks of it. So it does a lot of. But the data itself is not not affected. So yeah. Oh. Now we're going to be. Yeah. Now that now there's some. Um, Okay, thank you.